mentioned one other operator who's considering at the moment, and hopefully we've had a number of talks with them, so hopefully they'll come and talk to us again over the next couple of months. I think we're also talking about enhanced partnerships as well, so that some of that discussion has been kind of limited around there. But, but yes, we are still talking about this. Shane, do you want to comment? Yeah. Just to, to add, Coffee Boss to come in, uh, one of the challenges you've got with smaller operators is the ask to come to the alliance, the seven year averages, the fleet, etc. So when they've come in, the proposition is they've set out a two year business plan to come up to those standards, which the other operators were in agreement with, but each small operator we try and bring into the alliance, we have to recognise that there's an allowance, if you like, for an investment plan. Thanks, Shane. Go on. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, if we look at page 18, uh, at the very top we've got uh, Roman numeral uh, little 8. Uh, I think that's a very fair assessment of uh, how the Sefton review, uh, review went, as, uh, as it says, the majority review. We see very positively, and I think there's a good deal of imagination used, particularly around the goal where opportunity presented itself. However, and I can't always be nice uh, about things that someone does probably appreciate. But the sample one caused me a great deal of angst and concern, Chair, is because it, it's, it, it's left a, an area out there which just seemed to be around that high park estate of houses, missing a, a service. So is there any plans we can have to, uh, to look at that that way for the, for the next review? And uh, if you want to answer that, I'll come on to the, the next one or give you the next one now. So we, we always have to do a review at six months afterwards, so go back to what we what was in, in, implemented in that review. So we will be reviewing that within six months. Um, I know the area was Old Park Lane. I know that at worst people are 800 metres away from a bus stop. So we realise there's a gap there. But at the moment, due to the anticipated cost, it's not possible to provide that replacement provision. So that we will look to review that. Thanks very much. And um, the other one's about the RTI, and we've got page 23.42. Just to uh, have a, maybe a better understanding of the, uh, the accuracy of 95.3% of the region, it's just that maybe it's uh, people in my area are producing 95.3% of their. Of Remainders of the 100% of complaints about the system being out. So, is, how do we find that need to be that accuracy? And where does it fit in with it being since the rollout of the new ECM? We're using those new ticket machines to be able to track the reliability and punctuality of the, of the bus network. So, now that we've got the new ticket machines in, it, we can track those individual ticket machines. Helen? Thank you, Chair. Um, just a small question, really, um, related to paragraph 3.4.3, um, asking it for two reasons. One, because um, I know the area quite well where this demand responsive travel has been introduced, and I'm aware of the controversies before it started, but also if it works well, I can see some other places where it might be very useful. Um, are you able to comment at this early stage on how it's going? And I've got a little bit of information on that. So we've got a Renier and patronage. So the first four-week reporting period, there were 472 journeys were made on the new service. And this compared to right, uh, 2,214 on the uh, Route 211. So we can see that's running about 21% of what the 211 carried. However, I feel that within that first four-week period, there was a 39% growth between week one and week four. So we can see that that's sort of shot up since it's been introduced and there's evidence this is continuing to grow. So we are continuing to monitor that and we'll feedback on that because it is still quite early days. But um, yeah, and we also understand that some of the previous 211 passengers are now using the commercial network to make their journey and we've had no reports to us of anyone who's not able to access public transport as a result of the shipping provision. Okay, John. Just a general point really, um, it's regarding rural bus services and in particular I, I know we've had a lot of problems within St Helens and I know in Wirral a similar issue, uh, a number of issues going on with rural bus services and accountability, 39 bus in place in the 141 which is being provided. What
provision have we got to make sure that we, I know we, I keep coming back to this and budget responsibility within each of the areas of the city of Eden to make sure there's borrowed bus service versus services accessibility when a river are pulling out on every, a very short notice and leaving people without transport. How we make sure that, that those contingencies are in place like we did with the 39 bus service, even though people complain about the time is within St. Helens and, and the impact on Newton and Bergamon, which is uh, across the border into Cheshire. So it's again what provision you can provide us if we've got the road bus services across the board. I know it's mentioned briefly, but how we make sure that our contingencies are in place and the budget starts to quickly come up with a solution to that issue. It's predominantly our network review process, really, when we, we do look at each area and review the services that we've got within that and try to improve and reallocate provision. I was, I was just going to add the fact that they are ready, you know, we're very restricted budgets coming here. We've made those cuts and reductions. So when you say is the contingency there, quite frankly, that contingency is very thin at the moment through those years. But what we have to do is create some saving some innovative approach we've got quite a strong internal team that looks at solutions that would give meet the budget requirements but to be fair and open it, it will be a challenge yeah I mean, and obviously if you want to come back john obviously yeah. um, i totally accept those provisions um, and i think it is with a small budget work very well on that and it's how you quick quick you know look fast to react over the very nice service and sales i'm just trying to say when you're dealing with people like a reader who pull the quickly on Global services where I'll consult people. It's just important that we, which you are seeing to react, we're making sure there's a, it's written down in more detail the fact that we are doing it. It's like communicating what you're good at and make sure the public know what you're doing and fast about it and how good you are doing it because you work quite right fast off the ball with the 30, 39. And make sure the timetable people know them timetables are those. Thank you. To be fair, we, we introduced a protocol about changing our bus services through the alliance, so we would expect them to hold to that protocol. I think we never should ever lose sight of the fact that we haven't got the budget that we need to cover the network in the way that we know our residents need us to, and that's it squarely with the current government. And a certain gentleman will be having a slap up meal at this moment in time within the region. I doubt we'll be thinking about how people can get around our region on buses, but we will continue to argue our case, just as Ken says, because absolutely. There's so much that we need to do, but we need the same levels of resource that other parts of the country, notably London, have enjoyed for many, many years. I think there's some really good stuff uh, in this report, so I'd like to sort of thank the team accordingly. I think some of the bits that we didn't question, but we should note as success, the fact that contactless um, ticketing is now available on all buses is superb, and sort of um, the early uptake of that is, is really positive. Uh, the fact that Selwyn's have taken on uh, Avon's full depot in the world, so we're going to kind of bring uh, one of our existing operators, because they were always based in Runcorn, further into the region, is more good, um, good steps in the right direction. Um, I think the kind of, as Chris mentioned, the ambition in where we're going is really good. I think it's really practical. That's, there's a lot of things in here that sort of. Uh, the best city regions around the world are doing and actually we need to make sure that we've got a similar approach to get our people around and as we saw in the presentation earlier on in our briefing there's some very very exciting work on where the kind of future of buses is headed on that i should finally make this point because i've seen there's an article in the liverpool echo today so let me kind of deal with this um very very specifically um the nature of the devolved legislation we are dealing with is extremely prescriptive. Uh, many of you may have seen the folder I keep in my um, office which details the Bus Services Act. Having read that now three times, I can tell you it's riveting, but it's very, very prescriptive in the legislation that we have to follow. So believe you me, there is no dragging of feet in this organisation. We are doing everything we can to put together that business case that we are legally obliged to do and we will be bringing back our recommendations early in the new year so we can make sure that we can crack on and use whatever the right way of using devolved powers is for our city region. So make no mistake, the work has been done and it definitely will be coming back to us in the spring. Thank you. Okay then, if there's no further questions or comments, can I move the recommendations in paragraph 2.1 of the report, if that's agreed? Agreed. Excellent. 
Item number six is the Mersey Tunnel's long-term operations and maintenance strategy. And I think Suzanne's going to present this for us. Thank you, Jack. The report basically sets down to draft Mersey Tunnel's long-term operations and maintenance strategy for consideration and endorsement by members of the committee. The aims and vision of the strategy are all set out in page 69 of the report. What we've tried to do with this strategy is really portray the sheer complexity of the tunnels to get past this notion that they're just a couple of bits of road and a couple of bits of holes. If you put it into the context of the length of the tunnels and recognise that the Queensway is the longest road tunnel in the country and the Kingsway is not far behind it, and they're by far the longest estuarial crossings as well, and with that comes a massive amount of maintenance and operational requirements. We've set out within the strategy some basic historical context to really sort of re take the reader back to 1924 when these tunnels were first being sort of conceived and built to really remind them of the, the engineering feat that's been achieved in doing that. We've set out within the strategy an indicative 10 year 84 million capital maintenance programme, again just to show the sheer scale of what's required to keep these tunnels operational. Within Appendix 3 to the strategy, we've got quite a comprehensive long-term delivery and operations plan for building in the operations side again so that we can take forward some more innovative ways of operating the tunnels as well as sort of just the, the, the maintenance side of it again. Fundamentally, what we're doing with this strategy is setting out a robust long-term approach to ensuring that the tunnels remain a sustainable and efficient asset to support and grow the local and wider economy. I'm happy to take any questions on the strategy itself. Okay. Thanks very much, Chair. I'd like to say what an absolutely wonderful, fascinating, historical document. And it's been put together excellently by our officers. You know, I think we should commend them because I started to read it and I found it very, very fascinating. And, you know, and again, it shows the amount of work and dedication that our officers go to uh, to present these reports. There's one little thing which does step out on page 38, is the national tolling policy, because that's all everybody <laughs> seems to talk about, is what the tolls cost. And there's a quote there uh, on page 38, 2.31, and uh, it's relevant to whatever government's in, 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 in office. We have asked, I know Steve was the last one that about three or four years ago to ask would it be incorporated into the national network, we were told by the then Conservatives, no. So, you know, all the blame isn't on our side, but that doesn't take away from what a superb report this is. Thank you, Joe. Absolutely, Ken. I think we also shouldn't lose sight of the fact that it wasn't just that request that we made. Um, obviously, George Osborne and Philip Hammond, at the time extremely senior members uh, of the Conservative front bench, were going around this very region in the 2015 general election pledging that tolls would be free for certain residents, and nothing since that election has happened, and there's been no approach to this organisation. So I think it's very important that we keep reiterating that point that successive governments have chosen not to act on this matter. I've got Pat and then Francis, then Steve. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, just a comment first of all, then a question. Uh, table 4.16 gives the future demand projections. Um, I would only just say that the increases that are incorporated into that table uh, are not really consistent at all with our, you know, climate emergency aspirations. And if those figures become reality, we are totally failing in terms of uh, carbon emissions uh, and all the other aspects that go with, with increased car use. Uh, specifically under the item on flood risk, um, 8.8, and uh, thereon, we talk about flood risk, we talk about it in terms of a 1 in 100, 1 in 200 year um, probability. Um, I'm sure people don't need reminding here that those kind of um, statistics and numbers are rapidly becoming obsolete, and I note that it's reflected in 8.10 that a a detailed study is recommended in order to establish the degree of risk posed from inundation um, from flooding. And I'm just wondering what we're actually doing about that to actually conduct that detailed kind of work that would guide us in terms of what we really need to be doing to mitigate against the, the increasing likelihood of, of these kind of events. I can answer a couple of comments. The first one on the forecast. So 
put the forecast that's set out in 4.16, that's based on the transport model, I accept the comment about reduction of vehicles, but the first prudent thing for forecasting is to see if the, if the trend was to continue, could those structures accommodate the capacity that might be required out of the tunnel. If you get a less scenario case, a lower case, and there were different assumptions made on that model, then you would come up with a different proposition. So that's why the upper figure was shown in there. On the study, once the members are satisfied with this strategy report, what we will then uh, intend to do is to go to the workforce and set out to the workforce in January some consultations because they're coming from that work area, those staff are working on that project, those staff are doing the daily functions to set out what the plans are for, for investment on that side. Following that, we'll set up a governance structure which will be the tunnels board that will then implement that 84 million plan. One of the actions is the study that you've just discussed that would be one of the actions we would commission out of that. So your question was, what are we going to do about it? That's what, how we'd set out. So normally when we produce strategies, we have a costed implementation plan and then we put a governance structure in on the back of that to implement what's been agreed as an investment plan for the tunnels. And we've done that on other modes that we've secured approval of the strategies once it's gone through the Transport Committee. I'll also just at this juncture pick up on your comment, Pat, about um, traffic levels and the need to move to more sustainable and kind of more public transport uh, means. And certainly wouldn't disagree with that, but I would point out on page 52 we do highlight that there will need to be consideration on charging levels with regard to emissions of vehicles, so that's very much part of the thinking about how we could uh, prioritise and incentivise cleaner vehicles than the ones that create dirtier uh, emissions. So I'd kind of argue that it's, it's slightly more a mixed picture uh, than that accordingly. I've got Francis next. Uh, page 39, uh, through point 2, how much do we still own, Tom? I know this has been asked one time before. John, do you want to give us the latest mortgage repayments? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think we'd better get back to you with an accurate figure. But it is in the region of, I believe it's still in the region of 50 to 60 million. Um, it's, it's a significant amount. But we'll get back to you with, with the figure. Um, it sounds like a big amount, but there are huge infrastructure undertaking. We've not borrowed any new loans for the tunnels for a very significant number of years. Um, but it will be probably still another 20 odd years before the, before um, it's discharged. We, typically, we borrow over the life of the asset, and the tunnels last for hopefully a very, very long time. Yeah, and I think that it's a very important question to ask Francis because it's something that we, uh, and by we I don't mean us as a transport committee in Mersey Travel, I mean all 1.6 million people of the city region who ultimately own these tunnels. And I think it's an important point because there is still uh, a myth in certain quarters, not all, that the tunnels were paid off a long time ago and that the reality is that we joke about mortgage, but the mortgage is still to be out, uh, paid down, uh, with still sort of tens of million pounds to be owed. The other element in terms of the time to pay it off, one of the things we have actively looked at is could we choose to pay it off earlier? Because a lot of that debt was taken out in the 1960s at 1960s interest rate levels. The penalty payments for early payments are significant, but actually it, would be, it wouldn't be the best use of taxpayers' money to try and do that. So. It's a very good question and it's something we need to continually keep pointing out to people that actually this is the reality and that is one of the key reasons why it's older in place because that debt needs to be serviced and paid for. Okay. Steve. Oh, sorry. Oh, have we got another one? I've got, I've got sorry. I've got a couple of questions, yeah. Uh, page 60, um, right at the very bottom about the hydrogen uh, fuel fuel vehicles, uh, the tunnel. Um, I'm not able to use the tunnels without comprehensive risk assessment. Uh, just to pick up on that point, obviously if uh, you were having hydrogen vehicles, as you would do with any vehicles traveling through, you would have to do a risk assessment for that. It doesn't mean that uh, it couldn't be accommodated that, but it means you would have to give due consideration, so we'd have to uh, make a judgment call at that time. 
at the moment it's quite immature that, that sector at the moment, but it is an emerging option. So if it came to fruition, we would have to do a risk assessment on what we do. So we're just recognising and also his point at a generic risk that we would have to address in more detail later. Just one more question. Uh, page 65 about spare land in Wallasey um, where it's contaminated. Um, spo uh, spoiled, scattered uh, spoils on it. What, what contamination is it? Um, that's a section uh, of land over the tunnel uh, portal uh, uh, over uh, at the Liverpool end of the portal, and it was leased to um, Eldonians uh, in two separate leases about uh, 28 years ago, and they went into uh, liquidation. We have acquired that back, and part of that was it was a garden centre as part of it. Uh, there were restrictions on the lease that they shouldn't have uh, increased the amount of fill that was on the ground because there are certain weight restrictions on. And we found that actually they deposited material on that ground that we need to deal with. So the contamination is around that type of activity. And now that's come because we've regained the control of those leases that come back into our control just over a year ago. And now we need to address that issue. So when they say about contamination, it, it's from that sector. So it was a, a gardening type sector. And therefore, uh, there's overburden aspects of additional fill that shouldn't be there. And some of the fill and some of the uh, you know, for garden centre activity that would make that classified in theory as contaminants, but it's, it's in that context. Thank you very much. Shall I jump to answer that? Uh, not particularly to answer to, to that, but uh, the total amount of tunnels debt outstanding is 31.8 million at the end of this year. I mean, it's a bit like deja vu because we've had a we've had a Labour group meeting on this. We've had a we had a briefing earlier, but I, I think that the words are still poignant to uh, the, the comments I have been making. Uh, we we quite often come to this committee and we see piecemeal, you know, like the new electrics around the tunnels and so on and so forth. And we never really get the big picture, and neither do the public because we represent the public, and the public have uh, a conception or misconception that this is just a a long hole in the ground that you drive in one end and you come out and everything's on the door. And because it runs smoothly, people don't understand that there's stuff going on in the tunnel, the stuff goes on underneath the tunnel, the stuff that goes on above the tunnel, and stuff that goes on on the approaches and in and around, uh, around the tunnel. This is a huge piece of infrastructure, massively complex in, in its own right. And to, you know, the myth, another myth busted is that it will ever be free. Well, there will be a cost associated with operating it and maintaining it over the length, length of its lifetime. So I think this report really helps in terms of public perception about how complex the issue is, how massive a piece of uh, uh, expenditure it is on, on, a, on an ongoing basis. And I think, well, well done to everyone who, who's constructed this report. It's extremely helpful and it also gives a long-term vision of what to expect in the future. And finally, you know, we will be building up towards the end of this programme about what if the, the life of the tunnel expectancy does come to an end, what is next. So it leads us up very nicely and I congratulate the officers um, and everyone involved in, in the report. It really is beneficial. I think it's, I think would hope it gets unanimous sort of support from, from, from the committee. But it's just, just, just to, you know, say it, when we have people here who speak about one aspect of the tunnel, you've got to, got to see the whole picture and this gives us the whole picture. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Steve, couldn't sort of agree with that more. I think it's an exceptional report, really kind of highlights the fact that the tunnels are part of the city region's genuine golden assets, I suppose, to use that kind of analogy. And, you know, if you put them in the same category as um, the port, the local rail network, some of the very world famous buildings in the city centre, like the Three Graces and the cathedrals, these are at the heart of our economic and social well-being. If we didn't have the tunnels functioning well, we would be much poorer economically and much poorer socially because it would you know, cut off a lot of communication and travel back and forth across the river and make it more difficult. So I think it's great that that's kind of fully captured in the report. I also think it's superb that we're genuinely taking a long-term view. We know that kind of there could be um, significant things to consider in 20 or 30 years' time 
not for us to really think too much about now, but it's certainly right that we spot that they're on the horizon and think about what the steps might be to plan towards whatever a big renewal or potentially a new tour could mean when we get around to the 2050s. So now it's an exceptional kind of report, well done to all the officers and very much now completes, completes the suite of long-term strategies that we've got for tunnels, for ferries, for buses and for trains. And yeah, that's something that the officers should be very proud of and I think it puts the, the network in a very strong position. So if I can then move um, that the recommendations in paragraph 2.1 on page 25 are agreed. Excellent. Item 7, the final paper item, is the multi-operated ticketing scheme, the product and pricing update and proposals for the next um, financial year. Gary. Thank you, Chair. This is an annual report where, where this committee will consider recommendations for setting the prices for the organisation's multi-operator and multi-modal ticketing products for 2020. Uh, the detailed pricing of each individual product is listed as an appendix to the report, but it, it, to summarise it sees an annual increase across most of our products along RPI rates that are set through the national rail industry taking account of the July 2019 RPI levels, which February's benefit was 2.8%. Uh, subject to approval, the new rates uh, for all of the products will be introduced in January, in the first week of January 2020, apart from our term time and local education authority student term tickets, which actually wouldn't see an increase until August 2020. In setting these prices, we do consult with transport operators as part of those proposals and their views have been taken into account in setting and making the recommendations to committee today. I'm happy to take any questions in respect to that before moving forward. Lovely, thanks Gary. Any questions or comments that anyone wants to raise? Chris? Just a small one, just out of interest really. Um, obviously we've got a range of tickets there for the bus, train, ferry, etc. Um, so, someone buys a, a, an annual uh, trio ticket, how's that uh, money actually divided up between the different providers? Is that uh, sort of against the preset ratio uh, or is it kind of based on, on journey information? So, so in each of the products there's an overarching uh, operator agreement, scheme agreement which will deal with the apportionment model of that too. So that's how then that's apportioned out it will vary by products. Some of them are based on a smart usage data and some of them are based on survey related data. Any further questions or comments? If not, I'll just sort of very much endorse the report. I think this is a very good and practical proposal that you brought forward uh, as a team because obviously this fits in along with our long standing uh, policy of not having ticket price increases above inflation, only in line with inflation and that's the, the very practical proposal that's in front of us. I think one of the things that we should not lose sight of the fact is this actually is a delegated decision that we're taking today to inform this, this process and the reason I highlight that is because I think it has a very important impact. We're the only city region in this country outside of London that actually sets these prices for multimodal, multi-operator ticketing. Because we do that, actually the prices that are charged for these type of tickets are proportionally much better value and the equivalent that you will find in Greater Manchester, in the West Midlands, in West Yorkshire and beyond. And that's because we, as a transport authority, are setting those prices, not a ticketing company controlled by the transport operators. And that's 